Um, I am the leader of Wisconsin for Safe Technology. We are a nonprofit, volunteer based organization. <laughs> And we're part of a national coalition of organizations like ours, of over 100 organizations across the United States. So we're not alone in this. That group is called Americans for Responsible Technology. We are opposed to the 5G rollout, and citizens from Wisconsin went to Madison um, in July of last year to testify against the 5G bill that Governor Evers unfortunately signed. Catherine was there as well. We did our best to educate his staff and him, and he went ahead and signed that bill anyway. We even provided scientific testimony from scientists um, throughout the country and Canada, and he just seemed to ignore all that. Um, so our group is raising awareness about the harm by wireless technology, not only to our health, but our privacy, safety, and the environment. This is really affecting um, insects, bees, trees. So um, if you're interested in email updates, the clipboard over there, you can um, put your name on there and your email address. I promise I won't send you a lot of emails. I try to keep it with simple things that you can do to take action, or I try to share <coughs> Milwaukee or Wisconsin news. Um, there's a handout there. It's a small slip that provides other excellent websites, including um, Catherine's website, our website, and other websites. Believe me, I've seen it all, and I just narrowed it down to some real good ones. So thank you for being here tonight. Please share what you learn with others, and know that your wireless devices are not as innocent as they seem. Um, one last item, on April 25th, Saturday, it's Earth Day, <coughs> Stop 5G International. This is an international issue, um, is holding its second worldwide protest. The, fir the first one was um, a couple months ago. There were, I think, over 200 organized protests that day all over the world <coughs> against this 5G rollout. And um, Jill is with Oconomowoc for Safe Technology, and she and a few others are going to try and organize a Wisconsin protest. And if I have more information, I'll share it on our Facebook page, our website, and to anyone who signs up for the email. So now I would like to introduce tonight's speaker. Katherine Kleiber is an independent researcher, author, and educator with a background in zoology and molecular biology. She has been raising awareness about wireless technology and radio frequency sickness since 2001. So, Catherine. So, I have radio frequency sickness. That's how I first found out about this issue. And so, I am going to ask you all to turn your phones off. That means they should not be able to receive a call or any other wireless devices. And hopefully I can make it from one end of the presentation to the other in good shape and we can get the best out of this we can. Um, so if you wanted to go to the next slide. The first thing that you need to understand about... Have you turned your volume up? Uh, I actually don't have any volume. This is, this is a mic for the... Um, do you, do you need me to speak louder, or should I just use the mic? Okay. Okay. Is this better? Absolutely. Okay. Um, the first thing that you need to know um, about wireless technology is that the, um, the industry is inherently self-interested, just like every other industry that's out there. Their goal is to sell you product. And the more product they sell you, the happier they are. And they don't really care much beyond that. They're about profits. Um, they, they usually put nice window dressing on it so it sounds good, so it sounds like it's your, in your best interest. That's what marketing is about. But that is not why they're doing it. Why they're doing it is to make money. Um, just like other industries in the past, because they're only out to sell their product, they're not necessarily informing you of the risks. And there are now studies um, showing that there are substantial risks to wireless technology. Um, we have accepted this technology into our homes with very little question, I think in part due to um, movies and um, TV shows like Star Trek, where it's been 
glorified and it looks really neat and on a movie set and on a TV show whether it's safe or not doesn't really matter you can do whatever you want and make it look as good as you want um, so our next slide please so to start out um, what are small cells 5g and IOT um, most people you know they just hear that it's going to be great but they're not really sure exactly what it is so small cells are closely spaced um, transmitters that are short in stature, but they are not small in radiation. So it's basically like taking your very large cell tower and taking those transmitters off of there and just bring them close down to where you are. Um, the small cells are not necessarily going to run 5G frequencies right from the start because most people don't have 5G capable devices yet. So they're often um, going to be running 2G, 3G, 4G, LTE, um, and because they're close to you and there's lots of them, the speed and the number of connections they can have are higher. Um, and that's a lot of the reason that they're, they're doing, going for small cells, because that means that they can support the connections that they'll need to for the Internet of Things. The Internet of Things is this idea that you're going to have every single device in your household, in your whole life, connected via the Internet, and you can check your toaster from anywhere because that's really an important thing to be able to do. Um, 5G frequencies, when you get into the 5G frequencies, you're talking 24 gigahertz and above. And these are very, very high frequencies. Um, and again, they, they talk about it like they have to have these cell, these cell towers close because these frequencies don't travel far. And... On a rainy day, they probably don't travel that far, but you, you can tell, I'm sure if you have a cell phone, that your reception isn't as good on a rainy day because all wireless frequencies get absorbed more when there's rain in the atmosphere. Um, but on a sunny day at 73 gigahertz, um, this New York University study found that that signal can travel six miles. So you don't need one of these towers every block just on, on a basis of because the signal can't travel far. Um, it's important to note here, by the way, just most, of, most people have Wi-Fi. The frequency that Wi-Fi uses is 2.4 gigahertz, and that is the same frequency that you use in your microwave oven to heat your food. Um, so basically, when you're exposing yourself to Wi-Fi, you're exposing yourself to that same frequency. And if you listen to what the, they tell you deep in the owner's manual, like um, Elaine mentioned, you're going to be able to keep your exposure low enough, hopefully, so that you're not experiencing thermal effects. But that is all that that is protecting you from. If you get closer to it than that, you may not be protecting yourself even from the thermal effects. All right, next slide. So and there's another problem besides the health, possible health effects of having all of these small cells in 5G and IoT. Um, and that is that wireless technology is inherently energy inefficient. It takes 23 times more energy or more to send the same information using 4G as it does to send it on a wired connection. So every time you're downloading that video over a wireless connection, you are using way more energy than you would need to do that if you used a wired connection. Um, a lot of people like to talk about the data centers, but if you look at um, the study that's <coughs> quoted here at the top, what they found is that actually 90% of the energy used is the wireless connection. Only about 9% of it goes for those data centers. So your wireless that you have now, never mind the 5G, is highly energy inefficient, and we should be getting away from it solely on that basis. Um, at this time. The, um, the kind of the gold standard, if you will, of internet um, speed is, is the fiber optic connection. 5G, because it relies on the fiber optic connection to get the uh, message through, is going to have to be slower. And because it's, getting, it's shoving the, the message through the air instead of putting it on a wire or, in the case of fiber optic, um, sending it at the speed of light down the tube, um, it is going to be slower than a fiber optic connection. So 
In terms of speed, 5G is not faster than a fiber optic connection. A fiber optic connection is the fastest, best way to move data. Okay, let's... I guess I forgot to mention, as you put these um, communication devices into every, everyday objects, those objects are going to use more energy just because you've got it having to send data all the time. That takes energy each time. Okay, so 5G has another downside. NOAA has a water sensor, um, and the water sensor senses um, the emissions from the water. Uh, I forget, it's like 20... Well, it says they had 23.6 to 24, but I think it was they said 23.8 was there. Anyway, the point is that because the, the um, 5G starts at 24 gigahertz, and there's always, they don't generate just 24 gigahertz, there's bleed over into the lower frequencies a little bit. It, when they generate frequencies, it's not only the frequency, there's harmonics, there's other um, spurious frequencies that they generate. Um, it's going to interfere with NOAA's ability to do this water sensing. And what will happen is basically that's going to put NOAA's ability to forecast our weather back to where it was in 1980. And it's become about a 30% decrease, I think, in sensitivity yeah. for, for weather. So it's in all of our interest not to use these frequencies that are going to interfere with NOAA's weather forecasting ability. Um, so we can move on. Um, so what can you do? What, what can your local government do um, in terms of stopping this installation? Um, the first thing that, that causes a problem for us is the 1996 Telecom Act. Most people were not paying attention when this was passed. There was intensive lobbying by the telecommunications industry in you know, 1995, 96, as they were seeing the um, EPA was starting to think about regulating um, wireless communications, radio frequency emissions, um, particularly to protect from biological effects, not just thermal effects, but they were starting to look at protecting from biological effects. And they convinced Congress to pass this bill that they essentially wrote to give them carte blanche to install cell towers. So if you've been seeing cell towers go up around your community and you haven't been seeing the government do anything, it is not because those towers have been proven to be safe. It is because they have no choice. Um, local governments, as long as the FCC says it is safe, that law, 1996 Telecom Act, preempts the local governments from doing anything to protect public health and safety in the environment. That's how it's been interpreted in the court. Um, and then if that weren't enough, because there were still things that the government could do, you know, local governments could do in terms of zoning and in terms of um, uh, permits and that kind of thing that would limit or slow um, installation of small cells, the FCC tried to preempt local control on that too and limit what local governments could even charge for the use of their infrastructure. Um, so the 5G is going to be installed on lamp posts and, you know, basically utility infrastructure throughout the city. And what they would, they were, they have done in places is basically institute a fee schedule and, you know, institute spacing requirements and all kinds of stuff. And the FCC didn't like this because they felt that it was going to slow the installation of 5G. So they made a fee schedule for how much could be charged and they made rules saying you couldn't regulate this. You can't say, oh, we're going to have a deal with one company. You have to let all the companies in, that kind of thing. So this was actually overturned at the federal level in court um, because the FCC, it was ruled arbitrary and capricious. The FCC was arguing that this wasn't a federal program, that this was getting done at the state level. It wasn't, they, it wasn't a specific program. Um, well, the court didn't actually completely rule on that. They, they basically said that was preposterous, that it was not a federal program, and all federal programs are, are required to do what's called a NEPA evaluation before they go through. So um, it wasn't, that wasn't completely ruled on, but it was overturned on being arbitrary and capricious. So 
the feds aren't forcing this right now. However, um, because the FCC could see that this might happen, they started another docket, the, the OTAR docket. I think it's over the air receiver devices or something like that. Was the, the original rule was put in place so that you could have satellite dishes. Then it was modified so your satellite dishes could send a signal back. Well, now they've modified it, so, or they're in the process of aiming to modify it, so that small cell transmitters on private property could be installed without any local control. They wouldn't be allowed to require a permit or anything. Um, so that's something to watch. That's still in process at the moment. I haven't heard that that's been ruled on or that there's an order out. Um, Clearly, that would be a real problem from the pros prospect of health because your neighbor could decide to put up a small cell tower and you wouldn't be able to do anything about it. Um, Wisconsin 5G legislation, as Elaine mentioned, while there is no federal mandate, there is now a state law that res restricts what communities can do um, substantially. They There's... Very little wiggle room, if anything, left as far as um, what communities can do to stop small cells. So one of the things that needs to happen is that your legislators need to hear from you. We went and we talked to them at the assembly hearing. We raised very important issues, brought all kinds of research. Um, and there were people that were seriously disturbed, but the way they ended up addressing this was not to stop the legislation, it was to hold a voice vote. So nobody would be accountable. And then the governor signed it. Um, so this was happening last year during the budget process when nobody was paying attention. The news media didn't cover it really at all until after the budget process was done, and by that point it was pretty much a done deal and nobody was paying any attention. Um, so that needs to be repealed. Your legislators need to hear about it. You need to get them information. Uh, there's tons of good information on the Wisconsin for Safe Technology website. She's got some really good links to get you to other information. Um, you need to let your neighbors know. Because uh, this is really, this is about, they need to change the law, but they won't change the law until they hear from enough people. Um, and then another one, was passed in 2013. Again, nobody was really paying attention, but this one, again, took things further than the 1996 Telecom Act. Not quite as far as this last 5G legislation, but it severely restricted the, the municipality's ability to you know, restrict cell, uh, cell tower siting. Um, I believe AT&T was behind that, but I, I can't remember for absolute certainty. So those are two pieces of legislation that need to be repealed in Wisconsin to give us the same rights as other, p other states have in this country who have not passed the 5G legislation and don't have other, you know, something similar to Act, two Act 20 from 2013. Um, because the Telecom Act does restrict things pretty s severely, but it does allow for permitting, it allows for placing it away from, you know, populated areas. It allows for a certain amount of wiggle room. Um, so the next slide. So, as I said, we need to, to get the legislators to repeal these two bills that are really detrimental for the health and safety of Wisconsinites. Then you can get this policy report. Um, it's Small Cells in Boulder, Colorado. They did... Um, they hired a law firm to write up a report looking at what is being done and what can be done in communities that aren't facing the restrictions we have in Wisconsin. Um, and basically, there's, there, there are a fair number of things that can be done, even within the 1996 Telecom Act, to at least control the spread of 5G so that instead of having, like, five providers everywhere... Um, they have a minimal number of these sites because you could conceivably have one on every single pole. If you have, you know, every provider wants to provide within that municipal area, they're going to be basically everywhere. Um, the other thing they point out in this is that while the 1996 Telecom Act pre preempts uh, the ability for communities to act based on the environment and health, um, 
there are other reasons that communities might want to take action. And while they might want to consult with their legal departments on it, there are, that isn't preempted. So you can be making decisions based on promoting a responsible energy policy. Um, property values are definitely, a, you know, property value protection is definitely allowable under the Telecom Act. Um, the, the preserving of NOAA's capacity for accurate weather forecasts would be another reason you might be making these laws, but that's not necessarily preempted. Um, so that's, that's another avenue. And as far as the property values goes, the, the hit the property values take from transmitters is not inconsequential. What they're talking about when the study was done, and it was done quite a while ago, was about a 20% or up to a 20% hit for properties around cell towers. And that was at a time when what it was about was the aesthetics, for the most part, because most people weren't aware of the health effects. There is substantial information out there about the health effects, the detrimental health effects of living near one of these transmitters now. So I would expect that that property value hit around a cell tower is going to grow. If they were to redo that study, that that would be larger than it was. But, you know, whether my expectation <laughs> will be met, would be met, I, don't, I can't guarantee. So next slide. So why do we need... Small cells, 5G, and IoT. In brief, we, we don't. The industry wants to sell us something. They really want the data that having small cells and the IoT will create. We have been giving them our data. Every single person who walks around with a cell phone, and most of them track now, is giving them data. They're giving them data on their location at every minute. If the government said to you, I would like you to carry a tracking device with you everywhere you go, and in fact, I would like you to carry a tracking device that can measure every single metabolic activity in your body, maybe not every single one, but it can certainly track your respirations, it can track all kinds of things about you. I would like you to carry this around. I will pay you to carry it around. Every single person in this room would have been up in arms. But if the telecom company said to you, I'm going to give you this really neat communications device, and by the way, it can track you everywhere you go and know everything about you, but they didn't really say it real loud. But well, I'm going to charge you for it. Like almost the entire population carry these things now and give them their data. Um, and they want more because they can sell this. It's very monetarily beneficial to them. So in order to get you to want to do this for them, they need you to want high-speed connectivity anywhere, anytime, no matter what, so that you will go down and knock down the doors of your legislators saying, please give me 5G because I want to be able to watch faster cat videos while I stand at the bus stop, because it's really important to me. <laughs> and they, just in case that's not enough to sell you on it, they say, you need driverless cars. People are unreliable. Technology is really reliable. You have to have a driverless car, and that's going to make all the accidents go away. Everything's going to be safe. And while we're at it, you really need this for telemedicine. We're not going to finish talking about this now. We'll talk about it again later. But it's not necessary. All right. Um, so when I first started doing these talks, it was because I was asked to do a talk about the addictive nature of screen technology because I wrote an op-ed. And I couldn't really do this without at least mentioning this because it is so important. We're giving these things to our kids at very young ages. And if you watch adults, they can't actually function without practically doing thumb games on a constant basis. Well, kids are susceptible even more so because their brains are developing. So what these, they have done in order to get you to use that constantly as an adult is to de deliberately design their apps to be addictive. They use, you know, it operates on the same principle as gambling. 
at least that's part of it. You know, it's a variable reward schedule. You never know when you're going to get that ping. Um, so they, they designed these to be addictive that way. There's another aspect to this, though, because these are visual things, and your eyes actually are a direct window into your endocrine system. And we all kind of know this, but we never really made that connection. So you talk about fight and flight. You talk about the tiger that you see out of the corner of your eye. Well, when you have a screen in front of you, that screen motion, and even the screen itself, kind of does that same thing. So it stimulates, all screens do this, fight or flight in you. And the more you're looking at your screen, the more this gets stimulated all the time. And it shifts blood flow away from the cortex and the frontal lobe. And this is the same sort of blood flow shift as you see in addiction. And it also um, stimulates the release of adrenaline because that's what fight or flight is. So this reduces the brain's ability to make decisions, to organize, pay attention, control impulses, complete tasks, regulate emotions. Does this sound familiar to anybody as problems that are cropping up, especially in children? Um, so chronic stress, so chronic exposure to this leads to an elevated cortisol level, which can cause carbohydrate cravings, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and hormone imbalance. Again, familiar to anybody? Because we're seeing this a lot. I mean, if you, all you have to do is listen to the news. Diabetes rates are going up. High blood pressure is a real problem. Everybody's supposed to be on a pill. Um, metabolic syndrome. That's Anyway, eventually, this can lead to adrenal fatigue, in which case you get salt cravings, and some people can have a poor appetite then. So anyway, next slide. I would think this would also include television watching as well. It does, but the studies seem to show that, yes, television watching is a problem, but the small screens close up are worse. Are worse. Okay. What about computers? Yeah. The, the less kind of in-your-face all the time it gets, the better it is. But, yes, it is a problem. Um, so the studies show that screen technology is really contraindicated in children. They should not be having these in elementary school, and they probably shouldn't have them even in middle school. And in high school, they should have it as a class. It shouldn't be there all the time. Um, children learn better reading out of books and writing on paper. It's how it enters the brain. It involves more systems in your brain. It helps get that knowledge into you better, and it doesn't have the detrimental effects we just talked about. What? I was involved quite a bit in the fight against Common Core, and a few other things that were done in a lot of school libraries along the Michigan coast were dispensed with in favor of screens. Yeah, from that, that information a... I, I gathered about the retention rate from reading a book being about 67% and retention rate from the same thing from a video screen, about 35%. Okay, well, I, I can't comment on the exact numbers, but it's consistent. Um, so, there's, um, I, I'm going to get it wrong, Psycho psychologist, um, Dr. Victoria Dunkley, um, she came up with a name for this called electronic screen syndrome for kids who were exhibiting the symptoms of addiction and all of the um, endocrine misregulation. Um, and it is so important, especially if you have grandchildren, kids, to, to read the book Glow Kids by Nicholas Cardaris because he really lays it out in a very accessible fashion. And if you have a child or you have a grandchild who needs help, getting off of this addictive um, device. Um, Reset Your Brain by Dr. Victoria Dunkley is an excellent resource. Um, I can't stress enough <laughs> how damaging this is to give kids devices that have, start building these addictive pathways in their brains. I believe it was Dr. Dunkley talked about 
they've done studies and shown a correlation between these addictive pathways and later risky behavior in kids. So um, please read these books, particularly start with the Glow Kids. Take what you learn, bring it to friends, relatives, schools. It is so important that people start to understand that the promotion of this in education is not for the benefit of the children, it is for the benefit of the tech companies. Um, okay, why don't we... Okay, so the other thing that... that this has, it wasn't recognized in those books, but all screen devices, even when you put it on airplane mode, are RF devices. They're, they're just the way it functions, produces RF radiation. It's not for communication purposes. It is a byproduct of operation. Um, and it's called RFI, radio frequency interference. Um, the wireless devices emit radio frequency radiation in the microwave range for purposes of communication. But all of these screen devices produce RF just as kind of a byproduct of operation. And this is important because the effects of radio frequency radiation overlap what we just talked about with regard to the de app design and the, um, you know, the eye, the visual effects in terms of on your endocrine system. So let's discuss just a little bit what these um, standards are, or the, the limits are for emission of radiation, what they're based on. Because I think this is really important for people to understand. I did not have any idea back before I got sick, and I never used wireless devices. I got sick from dirty electricity, which we'll talk about later. Um, but I had no idea. I thought, you know, they're there to protect you, so they should be based on biological effects. This is not the case, and Elaine covered it, you know, to a degree when she was talking about it. They are based solely on protecting you from thermally based effects. So if it doesn't cook you, it's supposed to be safe. And I will grant you being cooked is not good. <laughs> but just because you're not cooked doesn't mean you're not affected biologically. Um, and the thing that they don't really talk about, except five layers deep, as Elaine mentioned, is that they allow, the Federal Communications Commission allows these devices to be tested at a distance from the body, they do have some limits on it, but at a distance from the body that the manufacturer determines. So if you are carrying your smartphone in your pocket, you are violating the terms under which that smartphone was tested. None of them are tested in body contact. That means that it will not likely be compliant with the FCC limits, the thermally based FCC limits, if you're carrying it in contact with your body. Um, so these limits were designed to protect a large man, and I do mean on a large man, there are probably not many of you in this room that qualify, over six feet tall with a very large head. Um, <laughs> You know, they're, they're, it was the G.I. Joe kind of concept, you know, very big, muscular, big guy. During a six-minute exposure, so that's how many of you only carry your cell phone around for six minutes and you're over six feet tall and you're 250 pounds. Um, so that, that's what it's supposed to be protecting you, under which circumstances. Would that be the same type of principle involved? Remember when years ago when police officers would um, have a uh, speed gun and in between cars, it, it was while they rested on their groin and ended up with cancer? It will get to that. And not, not that specifically, but, but yes, that's the, it, it, those would have been based on the same sort of thermal damage. And limits. I would hope not. Yeah, I, I saw one today. But hoping not and it not happening are probably two very different things. Um, so the FCC is considered a captured agency. Um, Norm Alster wrote a book about it, Captured Agency. 
And um, that basically means there's been a revolving door between the FCC and the telecommunications um, companies. Uh, our current FCC chairman, I believe, is from Verizon. He was a lawyer for them. So obviously, <laughs> having the industry regulate the industry is not going to necessarily bring the best consumer protection. So this is important for you to understand because in understanding it, it makes understanding radio frequency sickness a little easier. The FCC has classifications for RF emitters. They have incidental radiators, meaning these, these radiate as a result of operation. So these are electrical motors, dimmer switches, wall warts, or transformers, you know, the thing you plug in when you, when you charge your cell phone. That in itself emits RF. Um, unintentional radiators, which are devices that generate RF for internal use. This can be like computers, um, and electronics, some high efficiency lights. Um, so often with both of these, RF radiates. Um, they also both would produce dirty electricity, which is another way you can get exposed to radio frequencies. Um, and then you have all of the, the bottom ones, the unlicensed intentional radiators, industrial, scientific, and medical radiators, and licensed radiators. They all radiate RF on purpose. That's for communication, generally speaking. Okay. So let's... Why this is important... We'll, 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 oh. No, you're, you're fine. Okay. We can talk on either side. Why this is important particularly is because people with radio frequency sickness, which has also been called electrosensitivity, are often given a hard time. How can you be sensitive to this? How can you be sensitive to that? Well, it's all RF. And so that's what you need to take away from that slide. Um, so the FDA has been neglecting their duty to regulate electronic product radiation. And statutorily, they have a very clear obligation to regulate electronic product radiation, which is what we were just basically talking about with the, those intentional and in, incidental radiators, um, in a manner that is designed to protect public health and safety from electronic product radiation. Um, that is very broad when you go and look at their definition of electronic product radiation. It is basically any radiation emitted by an electronic product of any type. So they regulate your, your tanning beds and, you know, I mean, they regulate the whole, anything that emits radiation. They have almost entirely neglected to regulate radio frequency emissions from electronic products. The only product that there is radiation regulations um, for is the microwave oven. And that is a thermally based regulation to prevent you from cooking as quickly as your food. Um, but you will not be exposed to inconsequential radiation. If you stand in front of your food and you watch it turn around on the plate, or you like to watch the bag and popcorn blow up, you're getting exposed to a not insubstantial amount of microwave radiation because they are not leak-proof. They have put in place a standard, and it's, I think it's based on the same, same you know, not cooking you in six minutes standard, to, and, that, and that's, that's their sole electronic product radiation for radio frequencies. So they have been totally negligent in this area. And um, just in case... I, I put um, the, the quote from the FCC. They say almost all electronic or electrical products, devices, are capable of emitting radio frequency energy. So just so you, you know, we have it from the FCC themselves. So if you'll carry on. So dirty electricity. All of these devices that emit RF as radiators, are potentially producing it on the electrical wiring. This is what originally made me sick, was dirty electricity. Transients and harmonics and other RF polluting the 60 hertz sine wave you pay the electrical utility for. And it is a very potent source of exposure to radio frequencies. Um, your exposure can occur primarily through capacitive coupling and contact currents. And capacitive coupling, I, I demonstrated this for myself when I first found out about this many, many years ago. I sat on a wooden chair, put my feet up 
on the wooden chair, you know, I cross-legged, and um, Dave Stetzer had EKG patches on my ankles, and I could still see the waveform going through my body from the wiring in the, the room around me. And when we turned off our power, um, that was our first try at what do we do, because I was very sick at that point. I had been diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, and I was barely managing to get through my days, and I was in excruciating pain. Um, and that helped almost immediately. And we had a kind of a, a blinded check, if you will, because of the we would turn the power on in the morning so that everything... I, I don't know why we turned it all on. We just did, because we'd been in the habit of doing it. What were you diagnosed with again? Chronic fatigue syndrome. Oh. Um, it's a category they put you in when they don't know what's going on and you have a certain array of symptoms. Um, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> so you, you turn the power on in the morning. Ah, the thank morning, you. Yeah. yeah, so we would turn the power on in the morning and so what happened is by the end of the day I was pretty wiped out because I'm back to being exposed again. And so I went to bed early, and I said to my husband, can you turn off the power when you come to bed? And with all the best of intentions, he said yes. And I got up the next morning, and I hadn't slept well, and I felt like a train had hit me, and I just felt terrible. And I, I made it out to the shed, and I said to him, did you turn the power off last night? Because I feel awful. He's like, oops. <laughs> so... You know, I'd been, we'd had it off at night for like the previous week. And I'd been waking up in the morning. I'd been sleeping all right. I'd been, you know, it had been really good. So it was kind of this blinded, whoops. <laughs> but it, it kind of verified for us that it wasn't a fluke. And we then turned it off all the time, except a few select circuits. Um, and that made a huge difference. So let's move on. So that brings us to radio frequency sickness, microwave or radio frequency sickness, which is what I really had. It wasn't a mysterious ailment that nobody really knew anything about. It had been identified back in the 1940s. It's just that our doctors don't know anything about it. Um, it was first identified by the Soviets because they actually did the biological studies. They didn't just say, oh, it would be convenient if it, there were only thermal effects and listen to the physicists. They actually did the biological studies and they discovered that there's a constellation of symptoms and biological effects that <laughs> occur with exposure to wireless technology. Radio frequency interference and dirty electricity also cause the symptoms of radio, um, radio frequency or microwave sickness. Um, Kazakhstan, which we don't normally think of as a model for progressiveness necessarily, although we maybe should, um, at least in this instance, they established limits for dirty electricity. And their limits are 50 GS units. It's, there's a meter that they use to standardize against their um, other biological effects um, in terms of making sure that it was going to be, if they had 50 GS units in their buildings, that that wasn't going to make people sick. Hopefully. <laughs> um, and... Believe me, if you can find a building in the U.S. here that's 50 GS units only, you're pretty lucky because I haven't seen one yet without filters. All right. Um, so you might be wondering what are the symptoms of RF microwave sickness. And um, they are wide-ranging. So we've got neurological, headaches, dizziness, nausea, difficulty concentrating, memory impairment, irritability, depression, anxiety, agitation, sleep disorders, fatigue, weakness, altered reflexes, muscle pain, sleep, sleep, sleepiness, fever, neural degeneration, and psychosis. Cardiac, palpitations, arrhythmias, chest pain, low or high blood pressure, slow or fast heart rate, respiratory, shortness of breath, asthma, Dermatological, as dermographism, uh, for example, also other examples are psoriasis, eczema, inflammatory and allergic skin problems, increased per perspiration of the extremities. Ophthalmological, eye fatigue, ocular dysfunction, intraocular pressure change, cataracts. 
Others are loss of appetite, gastrointestinal tract diseases, abdominal pain, internal bleeding, hair loss, brittle nails, impaired sense of smell, enlarged thyroid, impaired renal function, increased activity of adrenal cortex, cerebral atherosclerosis, hematological abnormalities, immune abnormalities, altered blood sugar metabolism, changes in enzyme activity, hormone changes, miscarriages, and the list goes on from there. Can I just add something I learned this last week? I worked with a geneticist, and he was telling me that um, the autism spectrum has gotten so extreme, like people might have had autism before and it was more mild, and you see all these extreme cases. They have discovered, uh, Dr. Bob Miller out of Pennsylvania, he travels around the country and actually in other countries as well, educating people, and he said that the electromagnetic frequencies are, have a, a, a very heavy effect on those who have certain SNPs or genetic um, issues that would be more susceptible. We're all susceptible, but this is one of the greatest reasons why we're seeing such extreme autism these days. It, it is very, very likely there have been other papers, other people making the connection between autism and radio frequency exposure, and there's a lot of different things we could talk about in terms of why that could be, but I, I, yes. Okay, so, um, dirty electricity can be disabling. So people with chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and multiple, scler multiple sclerosis have found that minimizing exposure improves or even eliminates symptoms associated with their condition. Now, we have these um, MRIs from a gentleman uh, who, he had... Um, MS, and he he started he put in filters to eliminate his dirty electricity exposure as much as he could, and he found that he substantially recovered, and he was so adamant that he wanted to show that this had actually really because they would say oh well it must have been remitting or whatever that you just he's like no it's it's the filters and I have actually healed so he went back seven years later and had another scan done. And you can see that those lesions have substantially healed. Now, RF exposure is very pro-inflammatory. So it's really not surprising that an inflammatory condition would settle down and allow healing to begin if you can minimize that exposure. So let's move to that. Okay, so we also have RF exposure affecting diabetes. Um, the first graph on the, the far side for me... Um, is a graph of a type 2 diabetic. And she, you know, type 2 diabetics are told to exercise to help with their diabetes, which is good sense, and exercising is supposed to bring the blood sugar down. Well, what she did is show really well that the um, RFI and dirty electricity from her treadmill was really a problem. Um, the first set of graphs there, um, it's the before blood sugar. You can see it's lower. She exercises on her treadmill, and it gets higher. That's not what's supposed to happen. And the second set, where it's the, the gray and then the white instead, that's when she went to a mall. The malls are not actually all that clean, but apparently it's cleaner enough. And she exercised there. She walked around the mall instead. And you can see that her post-exercise blood sugar is lower than her pre-exercise blood sugar. So it did what it was supposed to there, but when she was walking on her treadmill, that was not helpful to her. Um, this next um, graph is a type 1 diabetic. And this is interesting because he's on an insulin pump. And so what you're seeing in the graph is actually the basal insulin rate and what you can see is that during his most active period, which is the summer months, and that's the gray there, um, he's out and about and, and he farms, so he's very active. Um, his basal insulin rate, so his insulin need, which should go down when he's exercising, is going up. Well, when he's out in the summer, he's at farmer's market near a bunch of cell towers. He's out in his fields where he's also exposed to cell tower radiation. 
And in the winter months, when he's sitting around on his rear end and his basal insulin rate should be going up, he's inside in a shielded house. So this is just wireless radiation affecting his blood sugar, his basal insulin need. Okay. What do you mean by shielded house? Just the, the extra thickness of the house? Um, there's ways to, to shield, and we can talk about it more specifically later, but there's way to, ways to block RF to some degree. It's not perfect, but you can be blocked. Okay, so dirty electricity harms children. Um, been a number so this these are our graphs of, of um, dirty electricity and I'm pretty sure these yeah these were at a high school um, the the top graph is without filters so that's all the all the red the lots of little lines that's showing you a lot of RF down on the bottom you can see there's a lot less of the red the the big nice sine wave looking thing that's the, the sine wave with, you can see the bumpling on there. Um, they used a filter to pull the bumple off and show it as the red because that's how it is in scale-wise. The, 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 the voltage of the high frequency is so much lower than the voltage of the sine wave overall. So you can't see it very well until you pull it off and look at it by itself. Um, but when they... The dirty electricity exposure has been minimized. Um, there were other diabetics. Actually, one family had two of them, two diabetic children. And when they minimized their exposure to the dirty electricity, blood sugar control improved. The one child actually went back into a honeymoon period. Um, another child, separate, separate family, um, stopped having the seizures that were hospitalizing him constantly. Um, there was an improvement in asthma, um, substantially improved behavior and um, cognitive issues. Um, in another family, they had a couple of children that were completely off the wall and having trouble in school, and they filtered their home and minimized their dirty electricity exposure, and it was like having a whole new set of kids. Um, so minimizing dirty electricity has improved the health of children and teachers and also improved classroom behavior allowing for more time for learning. Discipl disciplinary problems have also been reduced in number and severity. As a side benefit, one school experienced a substantial reduction in their equipment maintenance costs. Um, I was told by you know, a building um, principal that when they filtered in that school, that those kids, they went from having daily detentions for serious behavior problems to having like about a weekly detention for a child for like they didn't bother to do their homework or something like that. What would one go about shielding a classroom full of ceiling lights that are all fluorescent? Um, can we talk about this kind of at the end because we can kind of get into that way I get through what, what I've got first and then we can, is that all right? Yes. Okay. All right. Well, so again, Minimizing RF exposure, and this is not just dirty electricity. Dirty electricity was one, that was, like I said, that was what made me sick, and I was dealing with that predominantly until this whole wireless <laughs> insanity began. But I have had people who have, I have seen it in my children, I've seen it in other people's children, the more you can minimize their RF exposure across the board, the more you see an improvement in concentration, focus, ability to learn quickly, I've seen kids go from having real troubles to like it's like a sponge. It just, I mean, like no effort. Like the teaching, you just show it to them, and it, it's like um, improved sleep, improved appetite, headaches go away, um, disappearance of dermatitis, end of reflux, asthma decreases, you know, um, eliminating seizures and nosebleeds. And I have to talk about the heart rhythm thing. Because this happened in my children. They ended up with cardiac arrhythmias. If I had not known that that could happen, they would not have been treated properly. Um, they were never treated properly by the medical community, in spite of the fact that they had Holter monitors done and it showed sinus arrhythmia, which is what, if you start looking into the RF literature, happens. Um, they, you, you see clinginess, profuse, odiferous sweat, 
and it can be environmentally induced, despite what cardiac consults may say. And it should be treated. In this particular case, because it's being caused by RF, that means you eliminate or minimize as much as possible RF exposure, and those kids will do better. Minded. And it was very, very scary. I had a child who, when, when he was being exposed, we had to, we had to go off grid because of this. When he, we had one night when we slept back in our house, we had to sleep off, off like a three quarter of a mile, you know, half a mile away from our house, back up against the public land, was, you know, farthest we could get from an um, electrical grid. Uh, because they put smart meters on, and we are the we were the end of the line, and what that meant is that when the high frequencies from the smart meters got on the grid, they came down to the end of our line and they hopped off in our yard, and our house, and it caused these very serious exposures. All of us had cardiac arrhythmias, and we had a night we had to sleep back in the house because of a storm breaking the tent poles. And we had a night where my son woke me up in the night crying. He was very upset, but his heart rate was incredibly low. He had wet his pants because of the cardiac issues, and yet that was the size of a quarter. It was not a pants wetting because he lost bladder control because of volume. It was because of his cardiac arrhythmias. And I just... I see from time to time that, that, you know, you hear, you see something in the paper, you know, somebody saying, well, my child, you know, when they sleep in their room, they're always crying and they're clingy. And, and I just want to, you know, so I'm putting this out there to you so that you can tell people when they're having that problem that they should be really looking into this. This is not just their child being clingy for no reason, or at least not necessarily. Okay. Um. Biological mechanisms for health effects. The telecom companies and um, the industry in general is very fond of saying, oh, but there's no known mechanism. We can't possibly, you know, do something about this because we have no idea how it could be happening. There's no physics-based reason that this could be happening. Well, there are a lot of biologically-based mechanisms for how this can affect you. One is oxidation. Oxidation has been shown, I think it's um, 93 out of 100 studies they looked at showed that there were oxidative effects of RF exposure. Oxidation causes inflammation, it causes nutrient, nutrient depletion, and it causes aging. Um, I'm only 46. I shouldn't quite look like I look. <laughs> and I didn't, I looked very age appropriate up until shortly after the smart meters went in in the area. The exposure that has caused me my problems, I have never had a cell phone. I do not use wireless devices, never did. It's all, all based off of secondhand, and we'll talk at the end about, I finally figured out what was doing it. And so we've been addressing it, and it's been helping. And the aging effects, they're not entirely reversible, but some of them are. Um, but I, you know, I was, I became... RF sick first at age 22. You know, these kids are using these in school, in elementary school. We don't know what that's going to do to them because those people haven't gotten to where I am now. Um, it also causes interference in voltage-gated ion channels. Um, now, that may not mean much to anybody, but voltage-gated ion channels are very important in your body for communication. They are how your cells work in terms of letting things in and putting them out and signaling and all kinds of very important things. In addition to that, your kidneys operate using voltage-gated ion channels. That's how it maintains your, um, your ba balance, your electrolyte balance. So if you have these getting activated inappropriately, you could potentially end up with... Um, ion imbalances, electrolyte imbalances in the body. And these can have real effects on people. Um, many people just end up feeling lousy. Some people end up getting very belligerent, and they can experience psychosis. 
Um, and so these can have, and, and beyond that, certain ones in your brain can have mental health effects that go beyond just what I'm talking about in terms of electrolyte balance effects. So these are really important, and, and that shouldn't be sneezed at as a, an effect just because it sounds really technical. Um, they can cause DNA breakage. We all, well, I think we all know that that's not a good thing, um, especially if it happens in your germline cells, and young kids, have, especially young girls, have all the germline cells that they're ever going to have when they're sitting there with their Wi-Fi and whatever they're sitting with on their lap. Um, and it has the potential to cause DNA um, breakages and um, cause mutations in those germline cells that are then going to be carried on in females it will be forever because those um, mitochondrial if it, especially if it's mitochondrial DNA it, it, there's never a correction opportunity for that um, and I don't know that the rates have changed overall and it may not take it might take a long time to sort this all out because I don't know how much data they're actually gathering on this but just based on reading newspaper articles in our local papers lately there seem to be more kids suffering from bizarre genetic problems bones that break too easily and, and I'm not saying that that's never happened before but it just makes you go, hmm, when you know about this. Um, it interferes with melatonin secretion in action. And again, this is very important. It also interferes with um, EEGs. So if you don't sleep well, and melatonin is absolutely key for sleep, um, it is also involved in determining when kids hit puberty. So I don't know if you've been hearing that puberty is getting younger and younger. But I think this is part of why that's happening. Um, if you don't sleep properly, you don't function properly. You can't read facial expressions well. That's one of the side effects of not getting enough sleep. So back to your autism comment. Um, you, there's, there's just so much. It interferes with your mental health, your physical health. I mean, it's the foundation. If you don't get good sleep, you are not going to be as optimally healthy as you can be. And depending on how bad your sleep is, you're going to... You're <laughs> um, it causes direct metabolic in interference. Um, and one interesting example of this happens with that diabetic that was mentioned in the um, previous screen because... <coughs> Uh, that diabetic has taken insulin, had a cell phone nearby, not his own, somebody else's, and that insulin doesn't work. And he keeps taking insulin, and the blood sugar never goes down. Well, then the cell phone leaves, and all of a sudden, all that insulin works. So that diabetic experienced um, a, like a blood sugar of like 300, with the cell phone near, taking insulin, and then the cell phone left, and he's 30. So in that case, it would seem to be interfering with the ability of the insulin to act, because the insulin is there, and it acts once the cell phone leaves. Um, so it causes immune system impairment. This is important. This is especially important right now, um, there have been numerous instances of people who have minimized their RF exposure and then found that they get sick less often. When they get sick, they get less sick. It might, might account for some of the differences in how people are getting sick around the world with this recent coronavirus. It might, just might, relate to why our flu numbers are going up the last couple of years. The rate, the rate of exposure of people has been going up as people get more devices, they get more Wi-Fi, they get more connected, they get more doodads. It's all exposure been going up. Chemtrails blocking the wonderful healing benefits of the sun. I can't, I, I can't speak to chemtrails, I'm sorry. Um... So, again, these effects are 
are real. The, the science behind I'm, that I'm presenting is anecdotal, but if you go into the scientific literature, they're absolutely showing immune impairment, and they're showing immune hyperactivity as well. Um, so it increases membrane permeability. This includes the blood-brain barrier. This also seems to include the intestinal mucosa. So then you see things like leaky gut. Um, the membrane permeability, in the, especially on the blood-brain barrier, is something that they're trying to work on medically, they, to use it to deliver drugs into the brain. So you, you see, you can't have it kind of both ways. It has no biological effect, but we're using it to develop a medical treatment. If it doesn't have a biological effect, you can't be using it to develop a medical treatment. Um, it also causes the production of heat shock proteins, and I think that this is part of, you know, first off, this is your body saying this is a problem because that's a compensatory mechanism when you start to get too hot to allow you to be able to still function all right. So this is telling you that your body is still treating this exposure as an, an insult. But additionally, you can only compensate with heat shock proteins so much. So if you're having to produce your heat shock proteins to compensate for your wireless radiation exposure, you can't tolerate as much heat. And I don't know about you, but I have been watching people in the summer lately. I mean, people's activity level in the summer has gone down and down as the radiation levels have gone up and up, and I really think this is why. Okay. So the U.S. National Toxicology Program did a very expensive study um, with mice and RF. That's what we usually use to see if a, you know, a toxic exposure is a problem or not. And what they found out was that there was clear evidence of cancer for cardiac schwannomas, which is a nervous system cancer that's related to glioma and neuroma. Um, and these findings were confirmed in a European study at even lower levels. Um, a separate European study that was replicated found that RF is a cancer promoter. So you now have something not only causes cancer, DNA breakages, but it will promote cancers. And so there's going to be... Um, interactions with other you know, toxins in the environment that are causing cancer. and then Because that's, that's basically what they did, is they used a toxin that they knew would produce cancers and then exposed the mice to RF, and the mice that were exposed to RF grew more cancers than the mice that were not. Um, so this is also just showing that in the part of the brain that would be most exposed because of the way the antennas were at the time, that you're seeing more and more cancers in those regions. So um, the next slide. So this is my husband's term. <laughs> he says that wireless devices are things, you should look at them as portable cancer generators because that's basically what they are. The studies show that this is true. And they have lab and epidemiological studies showing this going back into the 1940s. Um, you know, at the time, and you will hear this still, well, we don't know that 5G causes the same thing that all the different other frequencies cause, but we should find out by exposing to you, you to it first. Um, and that's basically what's been done with wireless technology all along. These studies were there, and people had real reservations. People said this is not something you should be approving. But they approved it anyway in the 80s. That's how we ended up with cell phones, and there were supposed to be studies being done. That is actually completely against the Nuremberg Conventions. You're not supposed to be in an unconsenting, unending study that nobody's collecting the data for. Um, so the Chicago Tribune um, ran an expose that re revealed um, that off-the-shelf popular cell phones exceed RF, uh, the FCC radiation limits during standard testing. So even when they're allowed, the spacing that they're supposed to be allowed, many of them were exceeding the FCC limits. If you're carrying it against your body, it was even higher. And the um, French testing agency, they had already done this testing. So, you know, this was kind of an expected result. And all of this is very recent. Yes. This is just earlier this year. The, the phone gate scandal in France has been longer, but, um, and they've had to recall it's over 13 cell phones now 
in France, and their limits are higher than ours for cell phones. Um, so, and those same phones are being used here. So I can't guarantee you that the limits or the readings that they got in France are exactly the same as you get in the U.S., but it seems quite possible. Um, so this is a quote from um, Deborah Davis, uh, who is the head of EHT, Environmental Health Trust. Cell phones expose us to levels 2 to 10 times higher than FCC, according to cell phone radiation tests conducted by the French National Frequencies Agency on hundreds of cell phones. This is because cell phones are not tested in the way they are used, touching the body. When phones are radiation tested at body contact, they exceed limits. There was a lawyer's office that has filed a case in response to the Chicago Tribune, Tribune revelation, they retested the phone, not the same phones, I don't even, I think they got their own phones, tested those models of phones and found that, yes, they did exceed the limits and they filed a case. They filed a case against Apple and Samsung. Currently, Samsung is not being sued because if you have a Samsung phone, you have signed a waiver saying that you will go through binding, or, or binding arbitration or arbitration only. Um, I don't know exactly what's going to happen with the Samsung side of things, but the Apple trial is moving forward. At this time, that was the latest thing that I heard. Um, <coughs> don't... Most insurance companies are not insuring RF radiation health damages. So the towers are not insured, the phones are not insured, the municipalities that have their Wi-Fi in their buildings and are damaging their employees, that's probably not insured. Um, so if you want to find out about your phone, showthefineprint.org talks about fine print in different phones. Um, you can look it up. It's buried deep somewhere in there. <laughs> and I can't tell you on any given phone. I don't have one, so you'll have to search it out. All right. Um, health effects of RF exposure are already apparent. In case you haven't gathered this from what I've been saying earlier, I think we're seeing it already. There's increasing cancer rates. Um, the Huffington Post uh, ran a story about uh, millennials getting um, colon cancer. They have no idea why. Do you think maybe having their laptops and their um, pads right on their intestines might be a part of the problem? Um, back, I remember years ago, you know, the cell phone company saying, well, you couldn't possibly get brain cancer from a cell phone because the skull protects you. You don't have a skull on your abdomen. Um, we are seeing rampant depression, anxiety, irritability, poor sleep, lowered pain threshold, asthma, seizures, co and cognitive and cardiac, neurologic, cardiac and neurological effects. And these are all causally supported in the RF literature as happening as a result of RF. And you see it in the news all the time. And I realize that there is an effect of social media on some of these, but when you add it into the RF component that you cannot... Well, the vast majority of people are not accessing their social media without experiencing substantial RF exposure. I don't believe that those are necessarily separable. Um, RF-linked cognitive difficulties include memory and concentration problems and foggy thinking. And that is also something that you, you hear a lot about. There are epidemiological links to um, Alzheimer's and other cognitive you know, serious cognitive problems. So, um, More recent studies expose hazard, the hazardous nature of wireless radiation. We've got recent studies because one of the criticisms of the old studies that I was talking about was, well, we're using a new technology now. These are the studies of the new technology, although they will argue that this isn't 5G and may not, you know, completely involve 4G LTE, 
But when you have all of them following the same pattern up till now, to me, what that says is that we should call a halt to rolling out new ones until they've been tested. Um, Studies have shown that RF disrupts endocrine function, including effects on thyroid hormones, TSH, ACTH, cortisol, prolactin in females, and testosterone in males. Changes in adrenaline, noradrenaline, dopamine, and phenyl amine levels were found in response to an increase in ambient RF levels. And I want to draw your attention to this because dopamine is the addiction hormone. And what this did was it lowered dopamine levels. And if you don't think that makes you more susceptible to addictive agents, I think you should think again. And I think that this is related to why so many people are having so much trouble. First, it lowers their pain threshold, so they're in pain all the time. And then they end up being given something that boosts their dopamine up when their dopamine is low in addition to being in pain. And it's got to be a double whammy. I don't see how it isn't. Um, A mouse study found that changes in cardiac function and structure can be caused by exposure to radiation from wireless technology. And I'm saying this is probably at least in part due to changes in electrolyte balance since that same study found that renin levels were elevated. And this gets back to what I was talking about, about the ion channels. If your electrolytes are getting put off kilter, not normal for you, they may be normal, but if they're not normal for you, and it's causing you cardiac arrhythmias, one of the things that that can do is enlarge your heart or portions of your heart. In this case, I think it was the left ventricle, but you might have to look at the study. Um, And that in itself is detrimental. Um, it can predispose you toward heart attack. and um, So anyway, this would be consistent with RF exposure affecting voltage-gated ion channels and with findings in humans that RF exposure causes cardiac arrhythmia. So there have been studies done with decked phones that showed people were getting cardiac arrhythmia. Um, case studies document RF effects on blood glucose levels and insulin sensitivity. And we discussed that mostly earlier. So next one. So wireless radiation is also harming the environment. Um, The same metabolic interference, oxidative damage, inappropriate voltage-gated ion channel activation, it happens in plants and other animals as well. Um, This can have very real consequences. It can damage and kill trees and plants. um, In one study, it caused sterility in mice within about five generations. Um, And it reduced survival and um, interfered with metamorphosis and tadpoles. So if you like frogs and you're worried about the disappearance of frogs, which they are talking about, this would be one reason that that could be happening. Um, It interferes with bird reproduction and navigation. There have been a couple studies on that, and it also has um, chased birds out of of areas. All right. Um, So this is a slide about recognizing wireless damage to trees. Um, And we haven't really discussed exactly what happens as a a signal comes out of a tower. People have this kind of idea that it's probably, I mean, if anybody thinks about it at all, beyond the magic phase, you know, it's probably like an even mist you're sitting in, and it's not. Um, This is a a lilac bush that's only about yay big, so it's not not very big at all. Um, And... If you can see it clearly enough, and from my angle, I can't see it very well, but if you can see it clearly, you can see on the one side, there's a dark green, the far side away from me, or darker green, and on this side, it's it's pretty sparse, and it's a lighter green, and it's very stunted looking. And on that small lilac bush, I was able to measure different, very different RF levels in terms of where the, the, you know, growth was. So this is a different bush, and it had the least, and it was looking really healthy. And in here was uh, um, the better looking part of that same bush, and here it was pretty bare, and now it's pretty much dead on that side. And that's because the radiation comes more as beams, so there's areas of, small areas of higher concentration. Um, If you get an RF meter and you start to measure, you will be able to see that there is incredible variation from one spot to the next in terms of the the actual um, radiation levels. Um, And 
So in trees, you can get poorly formed or small leaves across the outside of the crown, where it's more vulnerable, and that kind of is protecting the inside of the crown, where it's a little bit less bad. You can get bare branches in the crown. So if you're looking at a tree that is otherwise good, but then there's just a dead spot that you can't even you can't figure out a reason for, this might be the reason. Um, you can get graying, yellowing, browning, and premature fall leaf color. Um, especially in spots like, or across the outside of the crown. And I don't know about you guys down here because I, I don't get down here all that often, but up by us, we're, the last three, four years, fall leaf color has been pretty miserable. Yeah. Um, yep. And this is probably why. Because the RF levels have been going up and up and up, and it's getting worse and worse. And um, our mulberry tree, I mean, there's, it's, got, it's dying at this point. The, the branches are dying in. And they have documented this as a result of RF. Um, we need those trees. They produce the oxygen we breathe. Um, and premature leaf loss without normal fall color uh, seems to be, well, A, it happens with RF, and, and B, it seems to lead to, to tree death pretty quickly. So, let's. so now let's come back to the 5G radiation, small cell radiation. Um, one of the problems with the 5G radiation is because the frequencies start to get so high, much higher than what we have normally been, normally been using is our detrimental you know, RF exposure thus far, um, you get to experience the resonance effect. And... There is a discussion that somebody did modeling, and they're saying that insects are going to start to see the resonance effects from these um, 5G frequencies. And they go high enough that you may well see cellular resonance effects. And so I wanted to give you an idea of what a resonance effect can do. Because I had seen the video of this when I was much younger, and basically what this is, is it's a bridge. You, know, you can see it whole on the far slide, side of the slide. That there was a certain wind speed that was resonant on the bridge. And after that wind blew for not all that very long, this is what happened to that bridge. And there are other examples. This isn't the only bridge this has ever happened to. 9-11. I can't comment. But not only is it not the only bridge that this has happened to, um, my kids were looking through one of the numerous books they read, and they showed me a picture of a nuclear reactor cooling tower that had had a resonance effect with a wind. And if you've seen these things, they're massive concrete structures, and it just fell apart. So when you start having a resonant effect in the freak with a frequency in your cell or in an insect, it's not going to be good. The common thing in the military when a bunch of soldiers are marching down the road, when they come to a bridge, it's break step. That makes a lot of sense because there have been bridges that fell down from the resonant effect of the marching. Yes. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Um, so 5G devices and downlink may result in thermal harm. They haven't really rolled this out yet. And so I took this quote... Um, and it was sent to an expert to say, can this really happen? You know, you look at this paper, this modeling that was done. You know, is this really going to happen? Is it under At the, the FCC limit, you know, with the, the, the limits they put in place. And the, the answer got back was, they're not really sure because they'd have to see what, what the levels are going to be, really, when the, it's actually employed. I looked at the, the study, and I am not a physicist, so I just had to take their word for it on what they're saying instead of redoing the modeling. But it sure looked like, at the levels they were allowing under the FCC, that in fact, if their modeling is correct, you would be seeing thermal harm. And this was the downlink, and part of the reason I'm saying it is the downlink is what everybody is going to experience. You do not have to use the device to be exposed to the downlink. I had seen that there might be thermal harm resulting to the person 
who's using the uplink device. I had not seen this before this comment that was put into the FCC, so they were aware of this. Um, so just I, put simplistically, a burn is a burn. Prolonged human exposure to the SAR of 4 to 300 watts per kilogram that is projected by Nassim and Kim would result in serious injury and possibly death. It does not matter to the victim whether the EMF energy comes from frequencies below or above 6 gigahertz. And the reason they're saying this is because they shifted at 6 gigahertz from using a SAR-based, which is not perfect, because that's just your thermal, to using a power density measurement that's not related to even the thermal. And they just said, well, if it's, if it's below this density, you're good. Which might look okay, except as, as those frequencies get higher, that energy's more. And since what they're saying, they said was, it's not going to go internal, it's all on your skin. Well, a burn is a burn. And the frequencies, I think, um, it was, I think it was 95 um, gigahertz, is what they use for the active denial military weapon, which basically makes people feel like their skin is burning and is basically makes people break and run because it's so awful. That's what they designed it to do. And that is within the 5G frequency range. So, all right, next. Driverless cars, we're back. Um, so we now know wireless radiation causes cognitive impairment, difficulty concentrating, impaired reflexes and cardiac arrhythmias, which could lead to driver heart attack. The radiation emitted by driverless cars will be getting everybody around that car. So you can argue that the occupant might be safer if you believe the technology is good, that the occupant might be safer. But everybody around that car is going to be getting irradiated. All the other drivers, all the pedestrians, and probably, like I said, the backup driver. Um, so you have a thing of potential benefits. They say this is going to be great. Weighed against very real harms. Carcinogenic, reproductive, neurological, cardiac, and endocrine effects of wireless radiation. I do not think that it is a good plan. Um, I believe that the alternative solution of minimizing vehicular radiation, radio frequency radiation exposures should be explored. It has not been explored. Um, I submitted into a docket at the FCC um, talking to them about the fact that, you know, these vehicles are full of that incidental and unintentional RF, and that if they minimize that by requiring those levels to be reduced, that they would probably eliminate a lot of the, the car accidents that are happening as a result of inattentive driving because people are impaired by their vehicles. It hasn't gone anywhere yet. When driverless cars fail, human operators are frequently not able to act fast enough to prevent an accident. And the reason for that is because they're sitting there, they have nothing to do, and they're really bored all the time. And they're not going to sit there as bored all the time as they are and just be watching like a hawk ready to take over at any second. It just doesn't happen. I mean, that's, it doesn't happen. And they've shown that it doesn't happen. Then the last part of this is the hackability of driverless cars. And they've shown that they're hackable. Um, and that's a safety hazard, because if you have a ton of these vehicles on the road and you have somebody malicious, they are going to hack them. Um, so there's a, a page on my website about RF and cars um, that has a lot more information about, about the RF that's present in cars, you know, deliberately and incidentally. Last month? When the Tesla car in autopilot crashed into a police car, they they issued a ticket to the gentleman that was sitting in the vehicle because they said he was still responsible, even though it was on autopilot. Okay, next one. So, 5G isn't necessary or safe for telemedicine. Um, wireless technology is inherently insecure and hackable. 
it is always going to be insecure and hackable because you have to have all these devices able to talk to each other, and you just simply can't make something that is unable to be hacked. Basically, a wireless device is shouting the information to the tower. And what they're counting on is that you can't understand it. But people, people are endlessly innovative, and they figure out ways to understand it and intercept it. So this is a quote from a recent FDA advisory. They're big on pushing this wireless you know, medicine stuff. Um, these cybersecurity vulnerabilities may allow a remote user to take control of a medical device and change its function, cause denial of service, or cause information leaks or uh, logical flaws, which may prevent a device from pro functioning properly or, or at all. While we are aware, not aware, of patients who may have been harmed by this particular cybersecurity vulnerability, the risk of patient harm, if such a vulnerability were left unaddressed, could be significant. Um, in looking back, there, there were a couple cases that I came across where you know, good hackers had exploited vulnerabilities. One was a pacemaker, and they were able to stop the pacemaker from delivering its um, pacemaking signal, and they were able to make it give a signal when it shouldn't. Um, they were also able to hack um, an um, insulin pump, and... Even if the, even if the uh, wireless capabilities on the pump were turned off, they were still able to hack the pump, cause it to deliver or not deliver insulin, and they could make it empty the reservoir, which means that they could give a fatal insulin dose. Um, so this isn't something to be sneezed at. And the only way to stop that, basically none of the alarms went off. They could bypass all the alarms on both these devices. Um, the only way to stop that with the insulin pump would be to shield it so you couldn't get into it. Um, so for all these reasons, 5G um, shouldn't be employed um, as in telemedicine. If you're going to be operating, I mean, because that's one of the big things they talk about is like you, you're going to operate using 5G, you're going to have your remote doctor who's going to, you know. Well, then that should be hooked up via fiber optic because you want a reliable signal and you want it to get there fast. You do not want that signal interrupted in the middle of an operation. And these the operations they're talking about doing are not like, you know, something to sneeze at either. It's not removing your mole or something. It's, these are big operations. So you do not want to be using a wireless connection. Um, you don't want somebody to be able to hack that either. And even with wired connections, there's always a vulnerability, but at least they have to get into the system. They can't just be sitting out in the hallway or something. Um, let's go on. Okay, so I told you I would explain um, what I've been getting sick from if I don't use wireless and I'm only getting secondhand. It's called the rusty bolt effect. This was first identified, to the best of my knowledge, by ham radio operators as a source of RF interference. They would be broadcasting at a certain frequency, and yet their neighbors would be getting interference way far away on the band. And it would happen consistently enough, and they'd say, oh, well, turn off your transmitter, and they turn off the transmitter, interference would go away. And they discovered that what was happening was that as the RF was crossing a metal-to-metal -metal junction with even a tiny amount of corrosion in it, it was becoming a diode or a, a transmitter itself. And it would transmit, it depends on the particular connection, and it depends on the frequencies going into it, and it depends on you know, all kinds of stuff like that, exactly what comes back out of it. But it has the potential of being a very broadband transmission from the kilohertz all the way up through the megahertz range and into the gigahertz range. And um, so in, in lay terms, there's a sparking event that occurs each time that current starts and stops across that. So as it alternates its way across, it's reversing direction. And it has the potential then to be generating RFI each time that happens. And so as you increase frequency, which happened with 4G LTE, a lot of us who have RF sickness really noticed when 4G LTE came into service. Um, 
And you're going to, I mean, the frequency increase that happened with 4G LTE is going to be dwarfed by what will happen with 5G if they actually start using the 5G frequencies. When did 4G come out? <sighs> okay. I'm sorry, it's, it's, no, it's okay. a number of years ago, and it was, I remember it was the springtime. It was in, or, um, anyway, I could look it up for you, but I, in my area, but it's going to vary with yeah. where you are. Um, so, if it, if it's with this, as you increase that frequency, you're going to have so much more RF generated. And the energy coming into there is going to be higher. Um, and we've, we've been reducing our potential rusty bolt sources, and it has really made a difference for us. Um, so that's, and, and this, this affects every single household in a developed nation, basically, because there's heat ducts, there's plumbing, there's metal corners on your corners, and they're all multi-part, almost, you know, certainly. Um, and so, I mean, there's just an infinite array of potential rusty bulb transmitters within any given household or any given building. And so, from a standpoint of just this effect, putting any wireless in the atmosphere, and especially at the rates that we're doing for our wireless devices, really doesn't make sense. Because the only way to stop this, there, there's mitigation you can do, and if you go to my website, I talk about it. But let me tell you, from having done it, that it's really a pain in the rear end, and it's not easy, and there's a limit to what you can do. And the best way is not to have the RF in the atmosphere to start. Okay. So, what can you do? You can wire your communications. You can opt out of transmitting utility meters. Which can be easier said than done. You can clean up your electrical environment by eliminating polluting electrical devices like dimmer switches and by adding filters. And I've got a list that's basically like a checklist on the solutions page at electricalpollution.com. And I recommend people print it because anybody who's trying to deal with this does much better with it, print it. <laughs> and then you can check it off, which always feels nice. Um, and then refocus your, your life on satisfying real social interactions and experiences because the studies show that that's what really makes people happy as opposed to all the Facebook stuff, which does not. Um, so that's, I guess we've got another. <coughs> and this is on the more, that's, that's on the personal scale, and then on the more broad scale, you can contact your alder person. You can ask them to remove wireless from municipal buildings and to take actions recommended in that Boulder report. Um, and you can contact your state legislators and ask them to repeal the 5G bill in the 2013 Act 20, which preempts local control. And you can contact your National Congress people, and they need to hear from a lot of people, and ask them to repeal Section 704 of the 1996 Telecom Act, because then we have rights on the local level again. Um, and investigate the FDA for regulatory negligence, and mandate that the EPA establish biologically-based population and environmentally protective RF safety limits for all sources of RF exposure. And that's, I guess we've got one more resource slide. So... There's some um, websites. These also on your website? The, these particular websites? I think they are. Um, I have the press release up about this event, and uh, most of those would have been on that. There's a small sheet of paper here and I, that has a lot of those. Um, so that's, that's the end of my kind of prepared presentation. 